Welcome to the Women in Vinyl podcast with Jen DiEugenio, founder of Women in Vinyl and contributor Robin Raymond. This podcast facilitates conversations with those working in the vinyl record industry to educate, demystify, and diversify the vinyl community. joining us for episode 52 of the Women in Vinyl podcast. Thanks for being here. You just heard West Side by Brisbane-based Full Flower Moon Band off their album also titled West Side. Find more and listen at fullflowermoonband.bandcamp.com. This week we head to Jamaica by way of New Jersey, joined by our friend and guide Joe Kay. Not only is he a great storyteller, but he is the founder and owner of Hold Fast Records. Joe has spent years cultivating relationships in Kingston, during which he's met people who have created and built the reggae music we all know and love. We learn how Joe and his wife got started in the industry and how his passion for community has taken him on a journey into the Jamaican vinyl scene. Reminder to grab a copy of our book, Women in Vinyl, The Art of Making Vinyl, out now. Go to womeninvinyl.com slash book. As a reminder, we have commercial-free and high-resolution versions of this podcast, along with our membership, and tons of other discount codes available at patreon.com slash women in vinyl. Thanks to you, we're number 11 on Feedspot's top vinyl podcasts. Please continue to like and subscribe. Now here's the episode. Thank you for joining us. And uh, could you tell our listeners who you are and a little bit about how you got into records? Uh, okay. My name's Joe. I'm one of the owners of Hold Fast Records. My wife is the other owner. Um, Woo! and yeah, she, she's the hero. I'm just here for my looks. Um, so basically <laughs> we, um, we're working in production. My wife was a bar manager and I was a, a running clubs. Um, and over the years we kind of both wanted out and, you know, I was working seven days a week, um, doing production and running stages and, We just never got to see each other, and we actually ended up, I shouldn't say we never got to see each other. We worked together every day, but we never got to spend real time together. You know, it was always that. So we kept saying, we're going to do something else, we're going to do something else, and then um, one day we just did something else. Hmm. You know, we we just made the move. Um, We opened the shop, and really, we had, we were broke. Yeah. Um, There was like, there's a couple times when our, our our bank account went down to a hundred dollars and we went to Atlantic City with the hundred dollars. Woo! Wow. You know, yeah. I love it. Yeah, and my and Megan <laughs> bartended, like I said, double shifting, bartending and and killing herself. And then I would leave the shop at seven and walk over to Bond Street Bar and work four nights a week over there, working the door and helping them like kind of build that bar up. And so I went from like running bars mm-hmm. and being the head of personnel on the boardwalk to like working a door, mm-hmm. anything we could do. Mm-hmm to just get that shop open. Um, but our theory with our shop from day one was we're not cool. Like we, we know we're not that cool cause we're kind of nerds mm-hmm. and we just kind of get it. And we just kind of, we're really annoyed with how we were treated growing up, going in record stores. Does that make any sense? You know? sure does. Oh, yeah. and mm-hmm. it, it just kind of pissed us off and we almost opened our record store out of spite. 
<laughs> I, I, I don't, you know, like, yeah. And then, and then when people were like, you're, you know, Asbury, when we opened the shop was still somewhat unpleasant and wasn't all, you know, they didn't uh -huh. polish the turd that much yet. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, we were having dragging people out of the store drunk midday and all, we were still, it was, it was rough. Nobody, no other businesses were open past five o'clock. Right. Um, so we were kind of keeping an eye, keep an eye on the street for the other businesses. And, you know, it, because of my relationships with the clubs and everything else, luckily we had good relationships with the people that live in that city and they mm -hmm. actually helped us and they would call us, you know, all times of day and night. Trust me. Hey man, I just went in the basement. There's 40 records here. If it was 10 records, we would go. Yeah. And, um, it, it didn't matter, but it almost became like a collective. So it looked like and felt like everybody was kind of like, we kind of felt like the underdogs. Maybe we weren't, but we felt like we were. So, and I think our customers kind of felt the same way. Yeah. You know, like we, we had a pretty rough go of it and everybody knew it. Like, yeah. we, you know, they, they saw us working seven days a week and running clubs and standing on stages. And I, I they had a picture of me. I fell asleep under a stage, oh. you know, but at the end of the day, our shop is our shop started because we didn't have a choice. It was either we start a business that we love because we love records and we actually just wanted to build a little community. Mm -hmm. But it's really because me and my wife wanted to hang out. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't I have a choice. That. Like we either had to open a business where we hang out or we're gonna have to go find other jobs. Yeah. And like we just want to hang out. Yeah. We really like each other. That's great. You know? <laughs> I love that. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Yeah, it's pretty simple, right? And were you, you guys were both record collectors like in your origin stories too my wife not so much i kind of had a i kind of collected for years but then it just i stopped um cold turkey like everybody else things changed and i sold my stuff to buy other stuff mm -hmm. and bills happened and mm -hmm. um the one thing that really changed for me was when i started working in the venues i was you know, pushing gear up a ramp and bar backing and anything I could do to get my foot in the door, sitting in my car in front of the club yeah. every day, just in case they needed somebody, uh -huh. you know? <laughs> and, um, and at one point, one of my buddies just said to me, he's like, do you, do you really need the records? And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, dude, if, if you really love music, it's the lifestyle. Everything else is just things. Yeah. And then I, I realized like, yeah, I don't need my records. I don't need anything. I just need to be involved i like I, I need to swim in music you know mm -hmm. yeah so i sold my my collection it's funny that buying you know, like buying and selling records got me back into loving music you know yeah mm -hmm. that's the beauty of it that's good if you're in production you know all of a sudden you stop knowing what bands sound like but you can say how much you can tell how much they'll draw yeah yeah people say oh you ever heard of this band i'm like yeah they draw like two thousand people like you ever heard of them i'm like nope i mean <laughs> I've tried to make a little bit more of an effort to pay attention to the various acts that I see on, yes. on the weekly. Um, the thing that kind of killed the, the, not even the love, but like the appreciation for music was mastering, to be honest. Like oh, well, I used yeah. to get jazz to be like, Oh yeah, I've worked with that band. Oh, these guys are super rad. And like, I'm sure you've been there, there too. We're like, if a band is really rad, you'll give them a little bit more leverage or like more of a chance. So if their music's yeah. kind of like, meh, you're like, oh, but they're sweet dudes. And they're like, they're really trying. Yeah, but like, yeah. if they're dicks, yeah. you're like, bye, 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 bye. <laughs> well, yeah, we always say, we always say one thing. And I mean, I'm sure you've heard this on that end of things where it's like, you're standing on a stage. And I said this, I won't say to who's tour manager, but I just looked him in the eye. I was like, hey, man, you know where the real money is. It's back here. I said, you guys are all temporary. Mm -hmm. I'll be here in five years. Yeah. You'll be playing some bumpkin bar next to a trailer park. Yeah. Yeah. So like you could be rude now. Tell your band to be a, a pack of dicks. I'm okay with it. Yeah. Because guess what? I got to hit a button. They sound like the cookie monster. I hit another button. They're smoked out. <laughs> Nobody could see them. And guess and, what? I yeah. still have a job tomorrow. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And I mean, like our... <laughs> our opinion of that goes a little bit farther too, because we're the ones that are going to talk to like other venues and tour managers and stuff. We can, I mean, we can shut people oh, yeah. down like real quick and people don't understand that sometimes. It's oh, no, nice. and, and that's, <laughs> that's the beauty of the internet. There is some good sides to the internet finally mm -hmm. where, you know, yeah, we, we worked with some bands over the years. Um, 
And I would say it was like phone calls were made. You know, mm -hmm. I was like, hey, oh, yeah. these guys came in here. We treated them like gold because I, I don't care who you are. If you're a local band or if you're Gandhi, I'm going to treat you the same. Yeah, because that's that's how I make you know, that's that's how you do it. That's and gig, yeah. um, you want you want to destroy my green room for no reason. You want to complain. You want to mouth off to the sound guy. Cool. Mm -hmm. Do it. Mm -hmm. But I'm just going to do it the right way. I'm going to warn the next five stage managers. I'm going to make the mm -hmm. call. I'm going to talk to your touring people. I'm going to talk to all the people. I'm going to talk to your A and R guy. I'm going to yes. talk to your record label. I'm going to talk to your you know agent. What? Yeah, the agents. Right. Like the first I'll have a job call. tomorrow. Truly. Yep. Because because now all my now my my club offers are going to dry up. Yep. So now the next band coming through with that agent, it isn't five grand. It's four grand mm -hmm. or less. Well, mm -hmm. Or or you don't or you don't get an answer when yeah. you email. Yeah. Me. I'm, <laughs> you know? I'm sorry. There's no there's no dates available. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No avails. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm running out of favors like you're running out of stages to play on. It's so weird. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I mean, but yeah, I, it's funny that collecting and for for this store was your yeah. like inlet back to it. So I yeah, mean, so what are you, were you guys like primarily just getting used collections first before you started to do the new kind yeah. of acquisitions? So our even now. Our new stock, like contemporary new stock, is only 10%. We are 90% used at all times. Incredible. Incredible. We go out and we are on the road every single day. Wow. We will fly out. We If it's 20 records, we go. If yep. it's a house with 30, that we go. Yep. It doesn't matter. Every rock gets on. Oh, we turn over every rock. Yep. We don't care. And, and I say this with such conviction because I wish I was lying. Because yeah. I would sleep more mm -hmm. and I'd see way less Monteavani records. <laughs> <laughs> but the reality is, if you want to do this right and bring people records at the right price, yeah. you have to find enough where it's not a $20 Fleetwood Mac record. To you, it's a $10 Fleetwood Mac record. Yeah. Yep. So we started 15 years ago, 20 years ago, yep. we started dealing with clean out guys yep. and we just put them all in our pocket. And we said, if you call me, even if I don't buy the records, I'll give you $50. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we just became reliable. Yeah. They would call us at two in the morning and be like, hey, I'm on my way to the flea market. Cool, dude. We'll see you there in 30 minutes. Sure. And meeting these guys at four in the morning, you know, oh. and and we up till about three or four months ago. Um, well, I should say longer than that because of my health issues. But we were doing flea markets like Wednesday through Sunday, leaving the house at three thirty in the morning. That's wow. Wild. And then and then we would be there till eight or nine in the morning. We would actually go through all the trucks, all the storage units, everything before they would put them out on the tables. Right. Because any offer they got, we would give double. Right. When everybody else is paying 50 cents a record, we were offering three to five, sometimes seven, $10 a record. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, if you own a shop, that's a scary position to be in. They yep. are always spending big money. Money. Yeah. yeah. So our thing is this, we, we go high volume. So I could tell you if you, if I can find 20 Fleetwood Max rumors, I will sell 20 tomorrow because um, as hard as we hustle to buy, we hustle to sell, but we keep our number up. So yeah. our margin is not huge. And yeah. dudes know that like people line oh, up yeah. when we do our, we do like dollar boxes, anything mm -hmm. under VG plus, And I'm stringent on, I am insane about condition. Huh. My VG plus is near mint. Yeah. Anything below VG plus is a dollar record. I don't care if it's an wow. $800 blue note. I don't yeah. care if it's a, an RL Led Zeppelin, that's a dollar. Uh -huh. huh. So when we do dollar dollar things, we get usually 30 to 50 people lined up. Wow. And we do like, it's almost like a whistle. We're like, all right, how about it? And then they all <laughs> jump all over each other. Okay, when's the uh, next one of those? Streaming. Because I feel like we need to come to that. Because that would be really fun. <laughs> Jersey, Jersey City. I do those in Jersey City. I got to look at the dates. But I do those in Jersey City all the time where I literally just put out like 20 or 30 boxes. Uh -huh. And everybody stands in front of a box. And then we just literally go, all right, go. And they just all jump in. It's crazy. Cool. Amanda Schutzman, this is your notice. She, yeah, she this. knows. Yeah. Um, yeah, oh, so this. Amanda, oh, no, Amanda's seen it. She yep. sits there and laughs and stands next to me. She's like, look at them all. They're crazy. I love it. <laughs> well, one of the reasons um, that Kathy connected us was because of Robin and I have been on this podcast virtual uh, tour of the world. <laughs> and yeah. um, and you um, have Beautiful quite... New Jersey. You called about New Jersey. <laughs> we did. Yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you know it. 
um, by about this... Palm River, New Jersey. <laughs> yes, by this by the seashore. But yeah, we heard great. about we your heights. It's amazing. We heard about your amazing uh, Jamaican connection, and to preface yeah. um, for listeners, there's a lot of things that we can't really share, but there are going to be. We just kind of wanted to talk about the culture a little bit, what things look like mm-hmm. there. Yeah. Um, so maybe how did that get started and, and how have you sort of grown um, that? So a buddy of mine, short version, there's really no short version, but I'll try it. But a buddy of mine, uh, Tommy was a huge reggae guy. And I, I was kind of in the reggae, I guess, you know, it's a punk rock retirement plan. You go from hardcore to this, to that. And then all of a sudden you're a reggae guy. Uh, it's just, True. I don't know. It's the natural Everything progression. Slows down. Yeah. yeah, it just slows yeah. Down. <laughs> Honestly, for me and you're a production person, I have insanely severe tinnitus and i'm also partially deaf in my left ear from working stage right for 20 years Mm -hmm. um so reggae was actually a choice not even a choice it was almost like hey this is all you can listen to without wanting to scratch your eyes out Mm -hmm. so um i was going out to to jamaica on you know a honeymoon and uh make it (laughs) yeah yeah it all all goes back to the beautiful wife she's awesome so so basically Augustus Pablo's son, Addis, had, had come in our shop a few times. And Augustus Pablo, you know, famous melodica player. Um, mm-hmm. He came in the shop a few times and everybody said, check out Rockers International in Kingston. But it's a little rough there, this and that. So me being the wonderful husband that I am, I kind of set it up so that when we landed, we were going to Port Antonio. We accidentally wound up landed in Kingston. In Kingston <laughs> and I was like, hey. <laughs> why don't we go to this really cool place and she was just like oh god you're the worst but so <laughs> we went i mean she was a willing accomplice the driver not so much the driver uh, was like you want to uh, go where <laughs> no <Yeah. laughs> um and orange orange street where rockers international is is a good spot i mean the it's a tough road but there there's good people on it ebo spice is there which is a great vegan spot there's a really cool bar there, Gus. You know, all these guys run across the street and this guy metal hangs out. Yeah. And um, but it is, if you're not used to that, it it'll like I was a little scared the first time I rolled through Kings and I was like, uh-huh. oh, oh, a lot of shaking your head and a lot of like, oh, this is this is legitimately a city. Like this is it, the real real, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You're not screwing around in Kingston. That was my first run through. So we went up. You know, guys standing in front of the place while we shopped kind of a thing to make sure nobody walked up on us. And we bought some stuff. And then I had the brilliant idea to go over to Studio One, which is, you know, a couple blocks away. Yep. Keep in mind, we know nobody other than like a phone call we made. Sure. So we're just blindly. Yeah, it was not the brightest. <laughs> so we go over to Studio One. There's a bunch of Yardies out front. Uh, Yardies are just like, you know, block kids yep. hanging out big gold sunglasses and socks up to the knees, fluorescent green. It's it's every dance hall video you've ever seen in real life. It's <laughs> awesome. awesome. Love it. It's it's awesome when you're looking at it from inside the car. Right. It's a little intimidating. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. So being really, you know, the smart, conscientious, great guy that I am with my wife in the car with a really scared driver, um, I got out and yelled into the 12-foot high gate with barbed wire on it, hey, man, I have a lot of money and I want to buy records. <laughs> and the gate man like most most spots in kingston have like a gate man guy just works the gate you know mm-hmm. and um the yardies all turned and looked at me you know and i was like hey yeah i'm the dumbest guy on the block so and then a dude <laughs> walked out and he's like oh he said and i quote boy you better get in here uh-huh and walked me in and um they car pulled in and the driver was really nervous he was just like ah oh, we shouldn't be here we shouldn't be here we shouldn't be here and, and the amazing thing was at this point i'm inside the studio one yard which yeah. is like the sun records of reggae yeah yeah right and the man's you know the man said uh what do you want not very pleasantly mm. and i said um i said listen i'm not i'm not here to do anything other than buy records i said i just want to do business man because mm-hmm. I had heard this thing over and over that everybody's tried an angle. Mm-hmm. Everybody said, oh, I'm doing a document. Oh, I'm doing this. Oh, I'm doing. Oh, I just want to be your friend. Oh, I want to go home and smoke herb with you. Oh, let's have dinner. So I just figured, like, let's be honest. I'm here to make money. I like reggae records. It's a bonus. I do what I love. But at the end of the day, I got to eat. Yeah, sure. So I just looked and said, I want to make money, man. I said, I got a lot of money. So he let me into Studio One, which cool. if you're a reggae guy, 
that's it. You've yeah. now crossed that line. You that's the Rubik. Your it's your universe. You figured it all out. You know, <laughs> he pulled some records for me and let me look at some stuff. Not a lot. Very. Uh, I said, "What's in that room?" You know, I was. I figured, hey, the brazen stupidity worked. Let's keep with it. Yeah, totally. And I kept saying, like, "What's in that room? Let's lean What's into in that it. room?" And he's like, "Yeah." He's like, "It's a bathroom." That's so I said, "Oh, I got nine bathrooms." Bed. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. And he's like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah." <clears throat> Basically, in five different Jamaican ways, told me to shut up. Right. So he said, "This is what you can buy." Some very cool records. Mm -hmm. And I just said, "Um, how much?" And he's like, you tell me ha. Um, that right there was clearly um, the first time in my life that I knew the next words out of my mouth were either going to mean me and my wife were leaving a property comfortably mm -hmm. or I was probably going to be dragged out. And right. I had said, you know, I just looked at him. I said, I'm not going to play the game with you. These are worth a lot of money. If you don't set the price, I'm just not going to take them. Hardball. I love and it. And he said, and he said, uh, let's do a hundred dollars. So I gave him a thousand. Yeah. You know, and yeah. the eyes went big and he said, All right, boy, have a good trip. And we got in the car and we left. Yeah. And we went on vacation and my wife was it was cool. We had a nice vacation. We we went home and then my phone rang. Um a couple months, a couple weeks later, excuse me. And it was, boy, you should come back. And uh, I got back on a plane. Yeah. And I just went down there, me and my buddy. And we just like threw mud against the wall and hope it stuck kind of thing. And yeah. it it was, uh, this has been on, going on for over 12 years now. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you as many of these places I've been in, um, Studio One, Penthouse Records, like we buddied up with Jermaine from Penthouse, who is the, one of the biggest dance hall producers in the world. Yeah who, you know, Buju Bantan and like all the dudes, you name it, that dude has done it as far as dance hall goes. Um, what I've learned it through all this and what got us through all this is obviously we love the crap out of vinyl, mm -hmm. but right. what they're doing there in Jamaica, they hand out 45s like they hand out business cards. I mean, I, I've, <laughs> I've had Jamaican dudes that DJ with me show up with 45s on a rope over their shoulder. Yeah, yeah, stacked. I know, it's wild. You know, and, and being on the island and going through these spots, I'm like, hey, man, I can't get to that top shelf. And they literally stack up LPs for me to stand on. And I'm standing on like $5,000 <laughs> worth of, of dub records yeah. to get like the $10,000 worth of dub plates, you know. So <laughs> what we realized pretty quickly over the first two or three trips um, was that this was way beyond us, uh -huh. that we are merely like passengers. Mm -hmm. And that everything we're going to get to see is a gift. Yeah. And it really has been. Not to sound cheesy, but I'm not a very spiritual guy. I'm, I'm a pretty clean, pretty cold cut guy on that end of things. And I would tell you um, what music does there, how vinyl plays into it, mm -hmm. it, it. It's it's insane to watch. You have people who climb telephone poles to run electric illegally, mm -hmm. to run pressing machines. And they're losing people. They're dying. They're they're literally getting electrocuted and dying doing this because they need. That's my biggest question because because it is such it has been such an integral part of the culture and it has been such a linchpin of export to get reggae and dub and all of this like culturally significant and influential music around the world. Why did the pressing plants just evaporate? Well, you you have you have an infrastructure there that's that's somewhat depleted. Obviously, you have a lot of poverty. You have a lot yeah. of people trying to do the right thing. But there's one basic underlying issue with almost everybody that you deal with in that community, mm -hmm. and it's one word: paranoia. Okay. Mm -hmm. They are all getting ripped off regularly. They know it, and, and there's only so many people that you can work with there that aren't paranoid about also other people on the island, not just Americans ripping them off, Jamaicans. So it's unfortunate because they're sitting on what could be this amazing thing, yeah. but they've, they've been screwed so many times. Yeah. And, and you, you almost fall into the trap when you're there that I, you know, people go with me 
to the island now. Mm -hmm. I'll take a friend. We vet people very heavily before we take them. Because if you say one wrong thing, you could get us killed. So we go down there and some of these guys, their head explodes. I'm like, hey, dude, here's an entire pressing plant that hasn't been moved. It hasn't moved in 12 years. Here's all the stampers. Here's the plates. Here's the this. Here's the that. And they're like, where do we pee? I go, oh, there's no bathroom. Yeah. You know, I go, go outside, go out there, and you'll see where they cut down, someone like cut down the telephone pole and took the power and cut it with a hatchet. Yeah. And it just sat idle for over, what, 12 years now, 15 years. And when it was open, it ran for six months. That was it. Before that, it was closed another 10 years. Jeez. So what you have a lot of, you have issues, and you have this beautiful island, you have this the people on Orange Street trying to do everything right. Mitchie at Rockers. You have Penthouse who's doing great things. You have Harry J's. You have the Sugarman Knot Yard. Yeah. But there's just this underlying corruption. There's this standstill, slow motion. Mm-hmm. You know, to get it done would take so much. And you need every little link on that gear to work yeah. in the Jamaica. And guess what? One link is always not going to work. Right. Mm-hmm. We've got, we've been doing this for ten years. I flew Southside Johnny down there. Yeah. Of all people, uh-huh. he was a huge reg. You know, he's a huge record guy. And and he was blown away. He was just like, "How did you just walk me into three hundred thousand records in four days?" Yeah. Yeah. And we we can't figure out how to get a pressing plant running down here. Yeah. I mean, it's it's funny too because like, especially with Jen and I. And all this entire goofy business that we find ourselves in and all of these incredible conversations that we find ourselves in, we know what it's like to work at pressing plants. So, I mean, yes. we know that it's not as easy as just like, yeah, flipping a switch and pressing <laughs> a button. But no, ch- chemicals, I mean, listen, there's, there's a scary yeah. thing. And, you know, from working in a plant, there's yep. a spot near one of the places we go. I, I can't say the name of, but one, one of the places we yep. go, there's a big circle. And the, the land is gray. Yeah. And it's where they used to just dump the chemicals on the ground. Right. And everybody says the same thing. Don't go over there. Don't, don't go, go there. not not like just don't go over there. Why? Yeah. We didn't know what to do with the chemicals. And there's another spot. I think I think I showed you some of these pictures, Jen, yeah. of just the labels, but they cut all the vinyl off, would mm-hmm. remelt it mm-hmm. and press with with you know, they're stamping over other records. Yeah, yeah. Um so you're getting gotta, ghost tracks. I gotta it's connect. So, it's so cool, with but crazy. One of, the, one of the, yeah, I gotta connect you with one of the owners of our record store because he's got the biggest dub collection in Canada, um, okay. and that's that's been his whole thing. And he used to get dub plates cut in Jamaica, um, like in the uh, early '90s and stuff. So I mean, you guys should be homies anyway. He's really yeah. great. Um, but yeah, yeah he's he's a super knowledgeable guy. But like, he's been giving me like gifting me some some goofy sevens and i mean yeah like some of them are just melted to shit and like the yeah. the lead in is so noisy i'm like oh this is weird but then once the first beat drops then it's like it's perfect and i'm like how the yeah, shit does this play it's crazy yeah, it's like that, that that mystical thing that surrounds blue notes like blue notes mm-hmm. you, you can stand on them and rub them with brillo pad and they'll still play Truly. and that that's kind of what happens with the jamaican stuff one way or another i mean yeah i'm like talking to the one of the ladies that used to work at the plan i'm friends with and she's 80 years old i think 78 yeah um if she's i i call her and i just say hey i got this record she goes only 50 made she's like an encyclopedia for this stuff it's awesome and i'm like hey i just found this 125 copies she goes yeah we never gave it back because they never paid for it so you're the only guy who has them whoa so all of a sudden you you own jamaican gospel that's never been released yeah yeah that's so you know but what this this all comes back to is like you look at the culture you look at what's going on there Mm-hmm. and this for some of the guys on the island is the only way out yeah so they're selling records they're doing everything they can you know rockers international is doing great things he sells to a lot of guys online he's doing everything he can yeah but there's this one thing that just seems to be missing and and the reality is it's because you can't get what you need there done the right way sometimes yeah. to get from point a to point b it's just, it's just not it's not a straight line right mm-hmm and because of the paranoia, you add paranoia into something that's already very hard to do in another country. Mm-hmm. And you add in crime and guns. And, you know, one of my buddies said, well, if you have access to 300,000 records, why don't you just buy them all? Mm-hmm. 
I said, I can't afford the amount of tax it would cost to put it on a boat. Yeah. He goes, oh, shipping wouldn't be that bad. I said, oh, it's not the shipping. It's getting it from here to there. Yeah. Right. We, we have to pay off dudes and drivers and security. Yeah. Get and, oh, Jamaica must be awesome. We see, a, you know, there's police checkpoints, military checkpoints. Of course. Um, a couple guys that have gone with us, their heads exploded the first day because they're like, so I'm like, what, what, what do you, what, this is your yeah. day now. This mm -hmm. is what, this is what you need to do to buy records here. You need to get stopped at a military checkpoint. You need a gun pointed at your car. You need to know how to talk to people. You need to walk in the local bar and put $50 and say, Hey, everybody drinks for free, free till we're off the block. Mm -hmm. You need to know how to navigate through a situation where you're not going to get robbed because people are greedy. You might get robbed because people are starving. Yeah. We don't understand that as as Americans. Yeah. And then people say, well, you're doing all this for records. The reality is I look at myself and the guys that I bring down there and other people that do travel. There's not a lot of us. Mm -hmm. We're the only outlet for some of these people. Yeah. And they deserve better. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, they really do. They're they're working way harder. I was going to say, like, you know, it it's always going to play in into these kind of conversations because there's always kind of that like white savior mentality when there's you know poverty and developing nations and things like that and now you're like the outlet you're the guy you're the the guy that's going in there and making these things accessible to all these other people like does that weigh on you at all no what wears on me is there's not more people who have enough balls to do it uh-huh keep telling me how much you love records right keep telling me how much you love reggae I can tell you right yeah. now, I can name five people that I know that have pictures in front of some of these old buildings that they got out of the car, they stood in front of it, they did the, right. the bullshit, and then jumped in the car and left. And, and, you know, I've lost some friends over it. Because I'm like, dude, you went to the island, you didn't stop here? You went to the island, you didn't stop there? Why don't you tell me? I'll make a call. You can go in there and shop. Yeah. No, dude, like, uh, that was crazy. That was crazy. Yeah. I'm like, so you got the selfie, but the dude still can't pay his bills. Yeah, right. He's doing it for the wrong reason. Yeah. You know, and not yeah. to drop the F bomb, but there's a whole lot of fuck off in my brain when, when I hear that. Yeah, because no. that mm -hmm. breaks my heart. Yeah. Because yeah. you'll pay to go to these resorts that doesn't, you know, they'll they'll pay to go to a resort, they'll pay to do all this stuff, mm -hmm. but they'll spend an hour in Kingston. Right. Nah. You mentioned too in one of the emails about um how nuns helped homeless children through music and how there's this yeah. like movement of women kind of making moves in Kingston. And I'm curious if you could expand yeah. a little bit more on that. There's a thing called the Alpha Boys School um, that started over 100 years ago, I believe it is. They were nuns. They were finding homeless children on the streets, bring them to the schools and handing them instruments and just saying, OK, now you're a horn player. OK, mm -hmm. now you're a drummer. And their success rate is insane because I'm sure you've heard of the Scatolites. Yeah. They are all members of the Alpha Boys School. They were all trained really? at the Alpha Boys School by nuns. Huh. They were all built as a band at the Alpha Boys School. And cool. then the Alpha Boys School still actively has a huge gathering every Sunday. And they do mass and they have a ska band play. It's like 12 pieces. Awesome. <laughs> now it's not exactly what it was. But that's how they learned most of their music from radio bouncing off of Cuba into Jamaica. So they learned a lot of blue beat and blues and jump beat and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And basically, you would just get handed a trumpet and they'd be like, you know what? Guess what, Tommy McCook? You're a horn player now. Well, I mean, if we know anything <laughs> about nuns, they're pretty uh, liberal with their ruler application. So, I mean, I would learn <laughs> a new instrument every week. Yeah. If I had There's some... a reason they're really good. That's what I mean. <laughs> I would learn a new yeah. instrument every week if I had somebody um, wanting to wrap my knuckles with a ruler. But <laughs> the cool thing is, if you check out check out the Alpha Boys School, right, their website, they have a radio station that runs. It's all members of the Alpha Boys School. And Amazing. it's like everything you've ever heard reggae from yeah. John Holt to Bob Marley to all these guys, at least one member on every song they play, at least one member is from the Alpha Boys School. Cool. it's it's amazing but once again this goes back to the record thing yeah tommy mccook the scatolites they finally get out they finally learn all this stuff they yeah. put out records they make money yeah. guys like earl chinna smith who wrote a good amount of bob marley's guitar so, you know his songs and everything else mm -hmm. who got paid 40 dollars yeah yeah i did a bunch of I records for al anderson yeah. not long ago when he did a north american tour so I mean, Crazy. yeah, I mean, and that was that was a cool through line for me too. 
um, because he was one of the original whalers too. And I was like, man, like, really? This is yeah. Okay, okay, cool. But yeah, I'm on the phone with a dude. And, you know, like Sly and Robbie played the Saint in Asbury Park to 50 people. Yeah, they they've done more rhythms and played on more records than I mean, name somebody. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And- I mean, do you do you think that dub and reggae is still kind of like that undiscovered kind of country because it is primarily record based still? I like, think I feel like there's a huge gap in people that don't get it, know it, love it, especially in a live scenario. I think there's a huge gap in people in general with music over Uh the last 20 years. I Mm -hmm. I think honestly, reggae has been put into like this little box and left there. And it's like, I only like it when, Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. people don't give it much more than that. Um, rock and everything else. You can always, Hey, rock sounds good at a barbecue, but reggae doesn't, I don't know. Everybody's different, but with reggae, I think part of the issue is you look at, these ups and downs like any other genre but then like chronics come out we have this huge hit chronics is everywhere and he's big and then it just disappears for whatever reason they don't seem to be able to carry Mm -hmm. as long as a lot of other genres and that that obviously you know you're in industry Mm -hmm. that also has a lot to do with who's pushing it Mm -hmm. and whose money is going where and Mm -hmm. who's getting their tour paid for and who isn't and i think reggae does get shorted a lot of times with that um, as far as the live crossover, reggae's never been a big draw in the U.S. Yeah. I mean, it's great in the U.K., but it's always been light in the U.S. You could put anybody on that stage and it's not going to draw off the reggae in the U.S. It's very hard. Yeah. You look at somebody like Coffee. I don't know if you know anything about Coffee. She's one of the bigger reggae artists coming out in the last couple of years. Okay. Started as a 16-year-old dance hall girl who just was like dr- crazy hip hop slash dance hall. Unbelievable. She's been up for some war- awards. I feel like if she was released as an American artist, mm-hmm. she'd, yeah. she'd be, you know, up there with all the big names. But because of her Jamaican upbringing, because of the patois, mm-hmm. because of all these other things that she sings about, she just doesn't get what she deserves. Right. And I think that plays into the fact that I'm not going to get dark on you here, but I think sometimes the music industry doesn't want certain people to make it. Yeah. I mean, the, the racism is is certainly apparent. It, yeah. I don't think it's 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 not only racism, it's it's culturalism. Classism, totally. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, there, there's a lot here. There's a lot. And Jamaica pays for that. Jamaica's yeah. misunderstood in so many ways. Because as much as I say, oh, it's crazy, there's guns. I'm in Kingston, this and that. Yeah. I'm also sitting on a curb and I watch Southside Johnny have a four hour conversation about the Philistines. <laughs> cool. I I talk music with dudes who I watch Southside Johnny play with Earl Chinna Smith in his front yard Mm -hmm. for 10 hours Mm -hmm. while guys from all over the yard, (laughs) dudes would, dudes just walked like kids walked up and just picked up instruments and they just jammed for 10 hours. Right. And then I realized I'm like, this is, I've been, I've seen millions of bands. I've sat on stages ranging from 200 band, you know, 200 cap rooms to 40,000 person festivals that I'm running. And then I'm sitting there and I'm like, this has been the most musically, I don't know the word for it. That's spiritually it changed me because I watched music get made for real for the first time. Right. You know, watching them move the plants around the yard to change how the, how the sound is in the yard. <laughs> really? uh, uh, just an amazing moment. I mean, the sound, yeah. the sound system part of the whole thing alone, like the dance hall culture and understanding yeah. of sonics and speaker building and everything is on another level anyway. Yeah like <laughs> and don't get me started because everybody's everybody has their whole theory on hip-hop i don't want to hear it toasting started hip-hop sure jamaican <laughs> culture yeah but yeah it the amazing part with all this to me once again is the fact that these guys no matter how bad it is for them no matter how hard people are trying to keep them down mm-hmm. sometimes they're not paranoid they are getting ripped off and people yep. are out to get them i had somebody from a major record label reach out to me an old friend and said Give me three reggae artists. And I went, yeah, you can go fuck yourself. Mm-hmm. And he's like, what? I'm like, I'm not going to be a part of that, dude. I know where they end up with you guys. You're going to shelf them because you'll find some other dude yeah. Yeah. who yeah. kind of fits what you need. Yeah. Yeah. So I know we hit 645 and I'm sorry, but really for me, what these dudes do down there, Carl over at, at Randy's record shop, mm-hmm. Mitchie over at Rockers International, Jermaine over at Penthouse, who's still active and he's helping, you know, Bougie get get his tour together for the U.S. 
and all these other guys that are out there, Harry J Studios, they, they're now run by his daughter. Um, they don't give a shit if they're failing or not. Because mm -hmm. to them, survival is success. Yeah. They're compelled. And we don't understand that. Yeah. You can't understand that. And I don't understand that. Yeah. So the white savior thing and all that nonsense. Yeah. I'm just another tool in their arsenal to get by. Yep. And God damn it. That's an honor. That's an yeah. honor. No, it, it, it's more like when people are looking on the outside that don't know, you know. Oh, yeah. No, screw like, them. Oh, you're the Listen, guy you know, that's the blah. That, that's oh, you want to piss, I mean. You want to piss me off? Put out a record if you're not from Jamaica and use your bullshit patois. Yeah. These right. DJs who are like, oh, yeah, but I'm like, listen, mm -hmm. dude, I'm on that island. I know the history of that. I know the culture. I know the religion. I do it all. The yeah. day you hear me use a patois, take me to totally. the pasture and shoot me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Don't and ever go to Toronto. Like, oh, yeah. Don't like, what are you, Toronto. the gatekeeper? <laughs> you like, give me the, are you the gatekeeper? And I go, no, I'm not the gatekeeper, man. I just respect it. And and that's where we're we're losing a lot here. Well, you know? you know where you fit in, and that and I think that's that's the most powerful part. So the the follow up question, if you just if you have a minute, is like, yeah. how is yeah, that yeah. Tra translating into your store? So is there are well, you creating? Like I don't have a store anymore. Oh, I don't have a store anymore. I'm on the road. I closed the store Fair a couple right. years ago. I'm on the road. Yeah, yeah. Um, but by I, your your buyership, like we, your, your people. Yeah, yeah. So we do our business. We changed the entire way we ran our business when we started going down to Jamaica. Right. We now are on this theory that everybody has to eat. Yeah. So it costs us more. What a concept. But it finds us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We just look around and we go, listen, if if you're going to sell me records, I'm going to pay you the right price. So you keep selling me records, which is just good business. business. Yeah. But also we look at it as we don't advertise much. Yeah. Because we think good people will bring us more good people. Mm -hmm. And the reality of it is we've surrounded ourselves with some, like, we're very, very lucky that we've surrounded ourselves with people. And if they do mess around and do business with other people, where are the consequences? Right. We think if you rip somebody else off and we find out, fuck you, starve. Mm -hmm. That's it. We don't do business with you anymore. We're done with you. Yeah. Jen, I, you don't know me very long, but I'm sure Amanda told you, I'm kind of. You screw around with one of the promoters and you're on a show. Guess what? I'm the first guy to walk over and I'll tell you like, yeah, dude, you don't belong here. Yep. Right. Because yeah. you know what? What are you going to take away from me? What are you going to do for me? And that's what I learned from the Jamaican culture and the music culture down there is like, what are you going to take away from me? Mm -hmm. Nothing. Because I'm doing it right. Sometimes it's okay to have the right enemies in this industry, True. whether it's on the stage, mm -hmm. whether it's at a record show, it does not matter. Because if, if you dislike me, the right guy's probably going to like me a little more. <laughs> Totally. But do you, are you, are you finding that you're selling a lot more of the reggae? Though? Like, are you finding that you're, yeah, you're yeah no, our, reg our reggae business. Yeah. We're, we, yeah. we do very well with reggae. Yeah. I show up, I usually bring a minimum thousand forty fives per show. Cool. You know, I have probably 30 or 40,000 sitting in storage, yeah. ready to go at all times. We buy out large collections. Yeah. We do well with reggae. Mm -hmm. We bring back three to 4,000 records every trip we go to Jamaica. Wow. Um, we overnight them through FedEx. We don't even screw around. Yeah, um, yeah we may, we do fine with reggae, but you know, we also do the same thing where with everything else. I could I could break even I can break even on reggae all day and I'm happy with it because yeah, guess what? Billy Joel pays my bills. <laughs> True. You know, reggae <laughs> reggae fills my heart, but Billy Joel pays my bills. The guy so the guys I, in I, Billy I Joel's around. band don't get paid by Billy Joel. <laughs> yeah. but, you know, at least the way, you're way you making money from Billy Joel. <laughs> <laughs> this this goes back to that whole that whole thing with like we started doing our business different. If I give the punk rock kid a good punk rock record for ten bucks instead of fifty bucks, mm -hmm. he'll spend five hundred over the next year. Yeah, yep, totally. With the reggae stuff, if I can give them the right records and it helps their mental health, who the hell am I not to do that for the Jamaicans? Right, exactly. That's it. I mean, there, there's it. It doesn't get any heart. It, there's no other math we need to do if we're keeping them sane and we're giving kids an outlet, yeah. whether it's punk rock or reggae. Yeah. Well, shit. As long as they're alive, they're going to spend money with me. Yeah. 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 We don't have to be cool. We just have to be right. Yeah. Well, I know that you need to go, so I want yeah, to ask yeah. you our. That, yeah. I want to ask you our impossible question, which fits so perfectly yeah. with what you're doing down there. Yeah. Um. Really. If you could create your own 45 with anything on the A side and anything on the B side, what would you put? Do you want to make it a reggae edition? That's cool. <laughs> no. Oh, I can't do that. That's so hard. 
Or Jesus. the like the the King. I'm gonna call it the Kingston special, and it's like ghost pressed on something yeah. else. <laughs> I would just, I would just, it would have to be a, it, it would have to be a 12 inch. It would just have to be like let King Tubby loose for like two sides. Ah, uh, yeah, King Love Tubby, that. that's wicked. Yeah, and then let, let Vaughn Benjamin from Midnight, who passed away, you know, may he rest in power, like passed away. Let him just come back and do a vocal track for me. Cool. And just let him, let him rip. I'll let, let him rip. I'll let, let him... I'll let you have a 12 inch. I think <laughs> you deserve it. Yeah. Look at reggae culture. What are you going to, that's why I hate 45s. I'm like, oh, cool. Can I have a six minute song, please? I mean, it's not supposed to be two minutes. But that's minutes. the thing. They, six they put, those crazy bastards used to cut six minutes, seven, 45. So like those six have like oh, yeah, true. Yeah, two right. millimeter yeah. run outs. And you're like, this is so yeah. stressful. What is <laughs> happening? Everything's off. I mean, or. I, the I very this very short them. story because I have to go. I actually bought like a great forty five down there. Never played the B side. I was like, "This is I don't know what it is. It's yeah. amazing." I yeah. play it. I get home. I play the B side. On the B side, they had a Kinks track for some reason. Come on, yeah. I swear <laughs> to God, I was like, yes. "What are we doing?" Recycling. It, just, it's like, <laughs> it is recycling. <laughs> I was like, "What are we even doing here?" My buddy's like, "You said this this track was awesome." I said, "Dude, this is the B side." I swear to God, the A side so good. And he's like. <laughs> The kinks? You went to Jamaica for the kinks? I was like, no, this 45 is what Jamaica is all about. Yeah. Like the A side was good, but the B side, not that the kinks are bad. It's just not what no. I expected. <laughs> That's not Jamaica, yeah. yeah. I mean that that I've never been to Jamaica. And I mean there's been a yeah, I mean a few reasons that for those kind of things. I mean, women traveling to sometimes uh sketchy areas tough. is sometimes no, it's is a little hard. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's hard to accept. Listen, it's very hard to accept a, a lot mm -hmm. of that culture, but it's also harder to accept that we're not going to change it in a day. Totally. Yeah. yeah. So and when I we're mean, down there, we have to act appropriately. We. No, yeah, no. And that's and, the thing. And when we're yeah. down there, and nor, nor should we. Yeah. We respect their rules and their religion when we're down there a lot of times. But I will tell yeah. you this. They also respect us now and will not do certain things around us. Some of them. And I think we have in some ways, there's 99% good people down there. Yeah. We have in some ways, though, showed them like, Hey, if you want to do business with us, yeah. that's not how you're going to talk to somebody. Yeah. 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 We're not the dudes. Like, yeah. we're just not the dudes. We just won't feed you. We don't give a shit. We're out. Like, yeah. we don't need to make money off you, and you don't need to have our money if we can't act appropriately. Record sure. mob mentality. Yeah. I'm so here for yeah. it. I love awesome. it. Well, Joe, hey, thank you so good much. Talk, guys. Yeah. Joe, appreciate your, your time. Yeah. Thanks, man. Hey, All it right. was a pleasure. Thank you. And uh, may you find good stuff. We'll see you out awesome. there. Yeah. Like it. All right. Be yeah. good. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Join the conversation on social media at Women in Vinyl. We want to hear from you. Shoot us a message for topics you want to hear, feedback, and more to info at womeninvinyl.com. Huge shout out and thank you for all our supporters, affiliates, and sponsors like Marshall Headphones. Visit our website, womeninvinyl.com, for ways to get involved. And you can always contribute to the education, demystification, and diversification of the vinyl industry by donating at womeninvinyl.com slash donate. See you next time. This episode has been brought to you by Women in Vinyl and Red Spade Records. Thank you for listening. Please remember to subscribe. And you can always contact us directly by visiting www.womeninvinyl.com.